What's up guys, Andrew Metal here. Another episode of Action and Ambition. In today's episode, I'm talking to Mark Birnbaum. He's a co-founder of Catch Restaurant Group. He just sold 50% of his business to Tillman Fertitta. Catch is arguably the hottest restaurant from New York to LA, and he talks all about what it takes to build a brand that attracts celebrities, plus a bunch of other amazing stories and insights. Check out the episode. Peace. Extra getting the VIP tour with co-owner Mark Birnbaum. The vibe here is very like escape from reality, almost vacation vibe. We have been shooting one person, three people, five people, eight people, 11 people. Yeah. It's like catch is not the place to be. Kendall Jenner had her 21st birthday here. The whole family was here. I really want to talk a little bit about your story and kind of what led to where you are now. What type of person were you growing up? Well, I was a social person, that's for sure. Yeah. I, you know, if I ever got in trouble, it was probably for talking too much. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's it's kind of nice that what kept me in trouble has gotten me out of trouble, so yeah, to speak, yeah. now. Um, but, yeah, even the first thing I did in, in hospitality was my senior year of college. Um, we, we had our after-prom parties in the city, in New York. And I wound up selling tickets for a friend of mine who made a business really of selling after prom party tickets in New York City. We would rent out a nightclub that allowed like 17 and older, I guess, which is crazy, <laughs> um, to do these like no alcohol club things after a prom. Um, I always sort of looked for entrepreneurial things to do, dating back to like snow blowing in my neighbor's yards when it snowed, I saw an opportunity. My dad had a snow blower, I went door to door and snow blowed and you know, made 10 or $20 as a kid. Did somebody instill that in you? Or do you think that was just kind of like a natural thing that you figured out on your own? Um, I think it's both. Um, my father owned his own business. Okay. Um, my mother eventually owned her own business. I think the conversations you have around the dinner table, you don't realize are lessons learned, but they, they become, mm. whether it's taking risk and not being afraid of it, and right, right. maybe not just having a traditional, you know, uh, nine to five job as an employee was something that you know I didn't really see so therefore didn't understand and I don't think I ever liked authority very much innately so therefore to have a boss was sort of a nightmare to me okay. um, when I got to college I saw another opportunity my sophomore year uh, a guy was in a pizza place talking about he was opening a nightclub I mean an old guy like from Yonkers like, I was upstate in Ithaca New York and I overheard him say, and I said, what are you talking about? He said, no, I'm opening a 22,000 square foot nightclub in the old Masonic temple in the commons of Ithaca. And I said, well, I, I could do that because I was promoting, you know, like summer parties in, <laughs> in, in the city for, again, college kids. Same guy, but we've evolved. Now we're out of proms. Now we're, now we're doing um, kind of college. And yeah, 18 clubs. and up. Or 21 and up when you yeah, weren't, yeah, but yeah. college parties. And again, keys to the castle, guest list at cool nightclubs in New York City, or at least we thought they were cool at the time, to be able to have a gathering spot and get in. Um, so based on that knowledge of basically nothing, but I <laughs> turned that into uh, what would become my career, which was you know running this nightclub. And then it evolved. I mean, uh, Buster Rhymes was in concert at Cornell University, the college next door, and I went and banged on his tour bus door for what it seemed like about four hours waiting <laughs> for them to open it and they were in there too because I heard them and eventually they opened the door and it was this guy Spliff from the Flip Mode Squad yeah, and I was yeah. like what? And I was like we got a club downtown do you guys want to come you know like tonight I'll do your after party for free I know you're performing at Cornell because Ithaca you know didn't really get those kind of acts I shut the door they came back they're like can you get us a bag of weed? I was like I'll try <laughs> and he said if you do that we're in Long story short, <laughs> I still know Busta Rhymes today. Um, but yeah, I was, cool. I was 19 or 20, I think, 20, 20 years old before I was even legally able to drink. Uh, I was throwing these big events and I was hiring the security guards or football players and I was having pledges of fraternities both at Cornell and at Ithaca pass out flyers because there was no email then and there was really? no mass texting. You just printed a flyer at Kinko's, a print shop and, you know, Candace ten dollars you know 18 and over to get in 21 to drink kind of thing show your id at the door dress to impress you know those yeah, kind yeah. of flyers and flyered parking lots and that's what we did and you know my friends were the djs and my friends were the bouncers and 
figured it out. Turned out it was not really a legitimate business, so it didn't last very long. Uh, not my fault, but it was, you know, again, an eye-opening thing. People were just pulling your seats out of the cash register and switching them at midnight. I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> but I didn't care. It was great. And that it learning is. experience was, was essential to where eventually it evolved. You obviously clearly wanted to be in that space, or you thought you would, and you still are. So it's funny to, to hear that that evolved at such an early age to like be in that space through that experience. I think you don't know until later what was going to happen. You know, it's not like I, I didn't dream a dream, uh, you know, as a kid, like I want to be a fireman. I want to be a nightclub owner or a restaurant. Owner. Right, you know, right. My parents weren't in the restaurant business. Nobody I knew was in the restaurant business. I never worked in a restaurant. Actually, I think I went for a job at a restaurant and didn't get it, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so what wound up becoming my career was based on, certain things that happened in my life, one being September 11th, being nearby, you know, across the street uh, where I was living was, and I watched that uh, tragedy happen. Uh, weeks later, my best friend since uh, really nursery school uh, died of cancer, kind of unexpectedly, Sorry, again at a young age. So I was 23 and I was doing a different job. I was in financial planning, selling life insurance, health oh, insurance. Yeah. I was good at it because I could sell anybody anything, but <clears throat> I certainly didn't have a passion, that's for sure. But I needed money to live in, the, in New York by myself and, you know, get on my feet. So I just took a job. But um, when that tragedy happened, it kind of was a, you know, I don't know if you call it the eureka moment or whatever. But um, I realized there was no sense in doing anything from that day forward, that day being my friend's funeral forward, that I didn't enjoy the next day and wanted to go to sleep looking forward to the next day and not caring about... I always say TGI Friday is bullshit because that means you don't necessarily enjoy your week right. and you're psyched for the weekend. I kind of feel like, why can't your whole life be Speed enjoyable? Off. I don't know. Yeah. Everything's not a vacation and it's not, you know, a Saturday night, but I don't know what, what makes me feel so like life is forever. I should just waste days and not being happy. Right. So I quit my job and I called my friend and we opened a nightclub to a year and a half later at 24 years old. It's cool. And yeah. what was the name of the nightclub? It was called Lobby. And so how did you guys go about like actually creating? Did you raise money? Did you have money saved or? I had zero dollars saved, the opposite. I think I was negative and overdraft. <laughs> that was, my life was overdraft. Yeah. Um, I said, I know how to throw parties. I don't know. I, I know people, I can talk to people and I'll just do what we need to do. We raised money. Um, I think we raised $800,000 um, from individuals. That's a whole nother story. We figured it out and I went up to Puff Daddy um, who was a, whose parties were a very big deal at that time. Um, they're still a big deal, but those days, I mean, it was like, you know, the puffy white party in the Hamptons and his birthdays or whatever he did. If he threw a party, everyone came right. and it was just, that's what, that's what everybody in the city was going to do. So I went up to him cold at a club and I, uh, told him how great he was basically in his ear. And I don't know if he could hear anything I was even saying, but I hoped he did. And I did look up to him. I admired him. He was like another young hustler who loved what he did and had passion and created something out of, um, you know, ambition really and passion for it. So, you know, I was very familiar with his career path and told him why he's amazing. And I'm an entrepreneur and young and trying to make something in New York City, which is not easy. And would you please throw your Zach Posen collaboration, which no one ever heard of Zach Posen at the time, but. They were up for a CFDA award that year for their first time with collaboration that he did with Sean John. I said, win or lose, doesn't matter. I, I'm sure you're going to win. But if you could just put me on the map, you know, and throw a party, it would probably catapult us, you know, as from nothing to something. And he was just nodding the whole time. And I'll never forget. And he goes, yeah, speak to her. And uh, <laughs> I'll do cute. that. I like that. And, and then I met uh, his two uh, party planning assistants that never left his side. And... Um, he did. He threw his opening party at Lobby. And because we had that, we also got another event and another event. We were able to, like, kind of use, well, Puffy's doing it, so. Right. And then others followed. Leverage the name. Yeah, and then one night he called me and said, I'm taking over your club tonight. I said, may I ask why? He's like, just trust me and tell everyone, you know, paparazzi to everyone would be there. I said, come on, you got to give me something. He's like, all right, Lenny Kravitz's birthday. He's dating Nicole Kidman. No one knows they're coming. I'm throwing a party for it. And that's when he lost his million dollar ring in the ice and we had to shut the club and lock the doors. <laughs> and, and I found it in the ice well. <laughs> Full diamond ring was crazy. True story. So 
these are the things that sort of like, you know, you build on, but you don't know that this is becoming a career. My parents, again, were like, you know, we paid for our college education. You do what you want. I didn't think you'd be a nightclub owner, or, yeah. you know, but you have to do what you love. So if you love what you do, you never go to work a day in your life. And that I think is true. For sure. And so at that age, 24, 25, or how old were you? Yeah, I was probably 25 at that point. So the nightclub is obviously doing well. It did well for me uh, in terms of experience and learning what to do, what not to do, um, uh, and and recognize that this was not it. This was, you know, maybe some people open a pizza place and they serve pizza there for a hundred years. Right. Or they open a restaurant, it's a family restaurant for a hundred years. Right. I sort of looked at it more like this is good, but it's not a career. It was a job that I enjoyed, but I need to figure out how to make it a little bit more professional right. somehow because right. it was pretty unprofessional, that that, <laughs> that thing. So I left that, that and I started a consulting business, which was basically saying if you're someone who has money, which was the hot thing at the time, a lot of people had a lot of money in 2005. 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, going into that big boom of 2008 crash. Okay. Rich guys were rich and they wanted to do stuff, right? So they wanted to open nightclubs. They didn't know how to open a nightclub. They just knew that they wanted to open a nightclub. So they wanted to be the guy, but well, how do you do that? So I was like, you know what? I, there's a need here. And I met a guy and, and he, in fact, wanted to open a club in the meatpacking district way before meatpacking was what it was or what it is. And on 13th and 9th Avenue, and he was like, help me put together everything. What does that mean? It means you need uh, staff, clearly. You need DJs. You need programming of, like, what nights are what. You need promoters. You need people to show up. You know, you needed all that stuff. Um, and he had no interest in doing that whatsoever. He just wanted to show up and be like, I'm the owner. Go to my table kind of thing. And Good. I was all about it. So I charged him as much money as I could get away with and put the team together. Nice. which is kind of what I did in Ithaca. And away we went. And then I met my partner Eugene during that time, which he was across the street uh, running Level V underneath Vento for Steve Hansen. We became friends, we had the same birthday, so we met that way. We were both born on June 10th, which eventually became our first nightclub together, 10 June, okay, which was right. a whole nother level of success. Right, and so um, with the consulting business, did you guys partner then, or you just met each other, you were friends? No, the consulting thing, whatever that was, was just me. He was doing something totally separate. So we formed M Group, EM Group, very creative, Eugene Mark Group. <laughs> group sounded like a bigger business than just the two of us. Yeah. <laughs> Our partner still today is David Barry, who met with us and his brother Michael Barry and agreed to give us the deal because W had approved us um, to be uh, authorized. I don't know how to explain, I don't know what they called it then, but like authorized um, hospitality operators within W Hotels. We, okay. were, we were an okay vendor, whatever, to yeah, be yeah, hired yeah. for new construction and new builds. Sure enough, the W Hoboken was being built which would take three years from the day that we got approved, but we got that contract to be the food, the beverage of the new W in Hoboken, which was right across the meatpack, you could see it. Nice. Right out of my window in my apartment, actually. Which was good, it gave it a little bit of, uh, you know, we have a future, of course it's three years from now, but for us it was amazing. Um, but first things first was 10 June SDK. SDK was our first kind of uh, inside experience into the restaurant side or the restaurant business at all. We helped create the menu, we did well, you know, the thing as a group, but we got to watch how it all you know, got put together and how to fill it and how to keep it going and make it last. But our concept ultimately was the one-stop shop, which was restaurant on the ground floor and second floor or whatever, and then basement use of a nightclub with a separate name, separate entrance, separate everything, run independently, but all had the same eye on the ball, which was, get people into the restaurant on the later side to create that late night vibe, sell alcohol upstairs more than it is a bar scene, and then everyone get up and go downstairs and don't get into a taxi. And we expanded from there. And did you use like, cause obviously you had built a pretty strong uh, pool of relationships, whether it was like Puffy or Busta Rhymes or just people that you had worked with in the past. Did you leverage some of those relationships like when you started your new things? Like Puffy opened 10 June. He did, okay, yeah, that's awesome. Best thing ever. Yeah. Once again, it was you know, Jay-Z, Beyonce, 
Pharrell, uh, Kanye, Penelope Cruz, Nas. I would never have gotten those people there. Yeah. But did he? He did like he did June Ambrose's book release party, and she was the stylist to all the hip hop stars and everybody. Yeah, yeah. Ten June was a place that kind of transformed our sort of model was live music performed hot club songs of the day or old school that everyone grew up listening to whether it was salt and pepper or whoever yeah um and not announce it it would just be like what's going to happen there but you can't make those things up and you and honestly you can't pay for it you can't learn it it's just you know you gotta i think with all entrepreneurs especially if you do nothing you're guaranteed one thing which is nothing good that's it good so if you don't get off your couch or you're like "Eh, do i really need to go to that event i've already been to 100 i don't know on the 101st in my first in my head i would think this could be the time a career opportunity occurs or a relationship is made that i don't know why but at some point will matter i don't know i just i always got off the couch right and uh you feel like uh like persistence or maybe not even persistence maybe just being open to like new opportunities is kind of like one of the, the the traits that you have that has led to your success i think it's never being content every time someone says wow you're doing well i think not really <laughs> you know like i appreciate the compliment you know but i don't think we ever believe our own yeah bullshit and the second you do you know someone else is there to just take you out yeah i also think that you either want to do things like this or you don't like yeah. i don't again i don't i don't think you're taught it i think you you open a restaurant or you open a club and on opening night you you're psyched but you're or i'm thinking well what's next good and i think that that could be a double edged sword sometimes you know, it could be a good thing if it goes well. It could be a very bad thing if you get too over over ambitious or whatever you want to call it. But I just was, ne- you know, I, again, we, we opened in New York. We were just fine there. My family's there. I live there, you know. And then, you know, we think, well, let's come to L.A. because it's a major market. And if we're going to expand, let's expand. So we did. And Catch is our brand that we've really expanded. Um, so can we talk about, like, the... Trans, I guess the transition from 10 June to Catch and kind of like how that came about? Well, after 10 June, not even after, during 10 June, we then uh, bought a club on 14th Street called Lotus that was 10 years old or so, and we took it over to turn it into Abe and Arthur's and SL, which was our first restaurant of our own. Abe and Arthur's named after our grandfather's, a steakhouse, That's and cool. underneath was the, the club. Uh, again, great. The only downside was is we opened it or we started construction right when Lehman Brothers was failing and AIG failed and the world turned upside down and we all looked at each other and were like, well, what? Everyone was rich yesterday. <laughs> oh, Everyone yeah. was just buying tables for 5000 or $10,000. Isn't that fun? Yeah. That's why did that end? Yeah. <laughs> totally ended. Um, but then we looked at each other like, look, we're young and we have nothing else to do. So we've got this space, it's in a good location. We believe strongly that regardless of a bad economy, people are going to go eat and they're going to drink and they're going to meet people in bars and they're gonna dance. That will not change, that is given. Now, the price they pay for that may change. It may be from $100 to $20, but I don't care if I'm selling burgers and pizza and hot wings, love them all, versus filet mignon and lobster tails. Let's see. But our rent was low enough at the time, um, and no one else was doing anything, and we called it the Forrest Gump effect, which meant we were just stupid enough to continue forward into (laughs) what was clearly a storm. And we survived it, but as a result, you know, as Forrest Gump went out into the storm because he just blindly went in, while the smart shrimping boat captain stayed on the shore, what happened? Because he was at sea and survived, he came back and he had a boat. Good. Everyone who stayed on the shore got destroyed because the storm took out their boats. It destroyed them all and they couldn't catch up. So he was the only one in town with Good. shrimp. Good. So we learned to do a lot more with a lot less, whether it be overhead and employees and um, you know, less wild parties maybe and spending a lot on entertainment or DJs and we kind of tightened our belts and grinded it out really. Yeah, two, three years had gone by. Uh, catch 
catch in in New York, we felt filled a need in terms of opportunity to eat at a seafood restaurant was pretty small. Well, what was cool too, I mean, it obviously became like a hot spot. I don't know how immediately, but catch has been. I mean, you talk to anyone, you know, millennial and older to younger even probably now, they know catch, whether it's in LA or New York or even Playa or wherever. Yeah. Like it's always like the hot spot to go, you know? And I think that's something you guys have done that's so effective, that's so hard, but you've always been like that it place. So can we uh, cruise over to catch and kind of show me what behind the scenes and everything? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So we're here at uh, Catch LA. Yes, sir. And uh, we got some cool um, shots in the back, which is awesome. So I know this restaurant's different. It has the open rooftop, which we got to witness. And uh, it differs from obviously the New York location, which has three floors. So tell me a little bit more about like the setup and, and this location. Yeah. So. New York, being that it's on three floors, works to an advantage and a disadvantage. It depends on how we looked at it. In this location, it's to our uh, disadvantage that we're on one large floor in that it's hard to make you know rooms disappear or to keep the energy in one area because clearly there's 10,000 square feet that you have to fill here. This is good because this is like our second floor in New York. This main dining room that we're sitting in right here is kind of the power room, the who's who of everybody. We, we have areas where we sit people where they know they like to be in corners or in our cages where it's a little bit more intimate or in the back corner where it's a little you know out of the way and less chaotic so you make a large 350 seat restaurant feel intimate like a 60 or 90 seat restaurant and that's what we've created multiple dining rooms within the dining room so what's next well next is uh, expansion of this brand um, and see where it takes us beyond, you know, Las Vegas, and then hopefully, you know, maybe something in Midtown Manhattan, eventually, hopefully London. What I do know is that it's important for New York to stay great, LA to, you know, continue to be great and get even better, um, and then tackle what's right in front of us, which is most important. And if we can do that, then, then we can go on to do more things, but it's sort of walk before you run forever. For sure, nice. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate, Appreciate it, it, man. Yeah. Awesome Thank to connect. Much. Thanks for the time. I love uh, all the feedback and insight you always have. So. No, I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Cool. Peace. Peace.